Alright, what's going on everyone? Today I'm going to show you how to build a budget version of one of Modern's top performing meta decks, and that is Mono Green Tron. I have done an overview for this deck. I won't be describing how this deck works because I've already done that. I will leave a link to that video in the description if you're interested in seeing how this deck works. I've also done a gameplay video with it, so you can check that out as well. But for now, we're going to see if we can get this going on a budget. So, Monitoring Tron is actually very easy to build on a budget. If you want to play this casually or even at a Friday Night Magic that isn't too competitive, a large portion of the deck is actually just bulk commons and uncommons, and we only need to make changes to the top and payoffs. So for starters, the Tron lands are very cheap. They're about 70 cents each, which is around like $2.80 for your playsets. So the Tron lands total price like $8. And I should note that these prices are in USD, US dollars. I know that's not relevant to most of you, but hopefully it just gives you an idea of how much we're spending on this. So $8 to $10 or so for your Tron lands. And these have been printed a ton. So there's tons of variety. You can get old borders. You can get new borders. You can get white borders. There are even ultra fancy full art variants. Although I'm guessing if you're watching a, you know, a guide for building on a budget, then you're probably not paying these kind of prices but uh nevertheless tron is very affordable so that's nice next is your tron assembly package expedition maps are currently a dollar fifty each so like six bucks for a playset ancient stirrings are 30 cents each so a little over a dollar for those and sylvan scryings are around 90 cents so you know 360 or so for the playset so once again very cheap the tron assembly package as i'm calling it like 12 bucks 10 to 12 dollars so at that point our total deck price 19 20 dollars not terrible we also need our color filterers so we can cast ancient stirrings and sylvan scrying and still get turn three tron so chromatic spheres those are a dollar each or so so four bucks for those chromatic stars are just 30 cents each so a little over a dollar um fun fact the stars were a whopping seven dollars each just a couple years ago i actually had three of them and sold them on card sphere so a couple years ago these would have been thirty dollars just for the chromatic stars thankfully they've been printed to oblivion their bulk commons now pretty nice uh, and then after that we have the big problem with building this deck on a budget which is our big top end threats karn and ugin are 25 to 30 dollars each and that's each that's per card and you need three to four copies of each card so you're looking at upwards of 220 dollars total for just these two planeswalkers uh, depending on how many of each one you play because every deck is a little bit different um and that's gonna be true for all this top end stuff every deck plays different top end threats and different numbers of each threat but uh the point is these are very expensive a uh, worm quill engine and walking ballista aren't much better worm quill engines being 25 dollars each ballistas being nearly 20 dollars each and the most expensive is ulamog sitting at a whopping 65 dollars each which is very expensive typically most decks only play like one ulamog but 65 dollars for a single card which is more than the entire tron package is pretty crazy we do have budget options to add to the deck though just bear in mind that the deck will definitely be weaker because of it but if you're playing casually if you're playing kitchen table magic this deck is still going to be extremely powerful it's just not optimized so if you're fine with playing like a sub optimal version of the deck for friday night magic or just playing a, a fairly powerful deck for casual uh we can definitely make this work so first off in the place of worm quill engine we could play something like scuttling doom engine this isn't nearly as good because worm quill engine can give us free wins against burn and aggro decks the lifelink is just too good but the doom engine is a nice budget alternative worm quill engines are over 25 dollars each and these scuttling doom engines are 20 cents each it's a big threat it's difficult to block and if the opponent has a kill spell for it it will blow up in their face deal six damage to either them or a planeswalker again not as good as getting two creatures right the reason worm coil engine is so good is first off it's just a massive threat on turn three 
but if the opponent can just kill it right away, you still get two creatures, you still get lifelink, you still get a death toucher that can trade for a big creature. That's why it's so good in this deck. And we're losing a lot of that, but still getting a 6-6 six, six that's going to blow up in the opponent's face if they have that removal spell. It's close, it's not as good, but you know, it's also 20 cents instead of $25. So it is a nice budget alternative. Similarly, we can also play Mere Battlesphere. While it's nowhere near as good as Karn, it's probably one of the better threats we can play for 7 mana. It's a 4-7, but it produces 4 one one, so it puts 8 power on the board on turn 3, and when we attack with it, we can tap the tokens to pump the battle sphere and also deal damage, right? So if you don't attack with the 1-1s, one you just attack for 4, you tap the 4 1-1s, one they'll deal 4 and then give plus 4 to the battle sphere, so you actually deal 12 damage, potentially on turn 4, if you play this on turn 3. So it's very powerful. It also gives us value if the opponent has a kill spell for the battle sphere. At least we still get the tokens. So it's similar to Worm Coil Engine in that regard. And it's nowhere, nowhere near as powerful as Karn, but it's much cheaper. Instead of $30 each, these are 30 cents each. So a dollar twenty or so uh, to fill the spot is perfectly fine. It's a very powerful card. Karn is preferable, but if you don't want to spend you know, $120 on four cards, $1.20, uh, a few mere battle spheres, perfectly fine on a budget for casual play. Now, we don't have a great replacement for Walking Ballista, but we can add like one or two steel hell kites in those sort of work so walking ballista is great because it offers a mana sink it allows us to use all of our excess mana every turn to add counters to it and that's useful when we're producing you know eight to twelve mana the fact that we can you know play something but still have four mana to put a counter on this or just you know, if we don't have any other plays we can just dump you know two to three counters on this it's, it's a mana sink right it gives us a use for our mana and the hell kite kind of acts like a mana sink and that we can pump its power up when it attacks and in the same way that walking ballista can remove counters to control the board by just you know shooting stuff down when the hell kite connects you can pay mana and blow up permanents based on how much you pay it's not the same because it can be blocked so there's no guarantee that you can uh blow stuff up um the mana sink it's not a permanent plus one plus one counter so it's like it's not uh perfect but the walking ballistas are 18 dollars each and the Hell kites are much cheaper, <laughs> as you can see, much cheaper. So on a budget, still hell kite kind of works, not as good, but kind of. Similarly, Clockwork Dragon can be played in the spot. It's kind of terrible. I don't think this card is great, but it does fill a similar role as Walking Ballista in that it gives you a mana sink for all that mana. You can dump your mana into it and produce plus one plus one counters. Uh, the difference being that when you attack with it, it loses counters and you can't remove them to kill stuff, which is what made Walking Ballista so good is that it could control the board and the Clockwork Dragon can't. But you know, on a budget, maybe it's fine at least it's an option. I mean, a Clockwork Dragon coming down on turn three and then getting two counters per turn, maybe three counters per turn, is still going to be pretty good, um, you know, in a, in a more casual environment. Other budget options to consider are things like Endbringer, Sundering Titan, Decimator of Provinces. Um, Endbringer has a lot of utility, even allowing you to draw extra cards, which is always nice. Sundering Titan can blow up the opponent's lands. Um, it is dangerous because if you control a forest, it will blow up your forest. If you're playing against a player who's playing green, then you can choose their forest. But if you're the only one that controls a forest, you have to choose your forest to blow up. So not perfect. However, this coming down on turn four, say, and potentially blowing up two of your opponent's lands is pretty powerful. And in multiples could actually be pretty devastating. Uh, again, we'll blow up your own forests. Not great, but I can see this actually being decent in this deck. Not terrible, just dangerous, and it could shut you off of ancient stirrings and stuff like that. So, you know, dangerous, painful, not perfect, but a, a nice budget option. And then Decimator of Provinces, I would not play this without Mere Battle Sphere. That's the only reason this is good, but with Mere Battle Sphere tokens on the battlefield, Decimator coming in, giving them all plus two, plus two, plus it has haste. 
can actually be pretty devastating. It can be pretty powerful. I wouldn't play more than one, maybe two. This is basically, Decimator is basically your budget replacement for Ulamog. Instead of having Ulamog for $65, you can pay, you know, a dollar or so for a Decimator of Provinces. And it's not as good by no, like nowhere near close as good. But one single copy to potentially like surprise win the game with the mirror tokens and stuff. Um, on a budget, it's kind of okay. So as you can see, there are a lot of options. You basically just want to fill the top end with whatever big colorless threats you own. You know, if you own, you know, a single Ugin or a single Karn, throw it in. If you own an Emrakul or an Ulamog, by all means, throw it in. Just make sure that you have somewhere between like 12 to 14 colorless threats. That's typically how many most decks play. And don't get too greedy either. Remember that you really want to cast seven drops on turn turn three that's how this deck wins right the tier one deck wants to cast karn on turn three so if you fill your deck with eldrazi titans because you already own them maybe you own two ulamogs and two emrakuls and, and a kozilek you might be tempted to throw all those in but that's not actually what you want to do because if you look at the actual deck if you look at the tier one deck it's worm quill engine karn ugin right it's a six drop a seven drop and an eight drop and yes the deck will play an ulamog or two sometimes but only one or two because you want the majority of your threats to be able to come down on turn three with Tron. So you want six or seven mana, maybe eight for turn four. So Scuttling Doom Engine, Mirror Battle Sphere, Sundering Titans. These are the things you want to be looking at, right? Six, seven, and eight drops are your sweet spot. You know, Steel Hellkite, Clockwork Dragon, and Bringer, also all fine choices. You want stuff in this mana range, and then you can add a 10, 12, 15 drop, one or two copies. Just don't get greedy with those, because those are more for the late game when you have tons and tons of Tron lands. You want to consistently have a six or seven drop on turn three. So one final change you can make, by the way, all is dust can be replaced with Oblivion Stone. In fact, many decks play Oblivion Stone anyway. If you look at Tron list, I would say 70% of them, maybe 60 or 70% of them play all is dust right now. And then, you know, some maybe like half play like one Oblivion Stone. Um, and then every once in a while, you'll see one with like two or three Oblivion Stones. So by choosing to play Oblivion Stone over all this dust, you're not really making a sacrifice. You're just choosing the cheaper option of the two cards that are usually played in this spot anyway. So Oblivion Stone, perfectly fine and much cheaper than all this dust. And just like that, guys, we have a budget casual mono green deck for extremely cheap. Here's an example of a deck list. You do not have to copy this card for card, but here's just an example. I just filled this out with uh with the top and stuff that i mentioned here's the price uh it's a little bit cheaper than the six to eight hundred dollars that mono green Chan typically costs and uh but this deck is perfectly fine at the kitchen table it's probably okay at friday night magic although you would need a sideboard as well and uh the good news about this is it's so cheap that you could definitely build this just for fun. It's not super expensive. And if you like it enough, you could always upgrade into Karns and Ugids and stuff. Uh, as time goes by, you know, you could buy a single Karn, add it to the deck. A month later, you could buy another Karn or an Ugin, right? And you could slowly upgrade it over time if you like. Uh, that's up to you. But uh, yeah, there you go, guys. Budget Mono Green Tron. It's totally doable. It's not as good as Tier 1 Tron, but it works. Not bad, guys. So there you go. Hopefully that is helpful. Be sure to subscribe for more videos like this in the future. And I will see you in the next one.